starting now. Go ahead, Frank. Okay, let's officially call the meeting to order. Vermont time is dark. <laughs> Already. <laughs> the sun goes down here at four o'clock because of the trees. I know. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Polly, uh, with sincere sympathies, uh, welcome back. You're muted, Polly. Yeah, you're muted, Polly. Thank you very much, there you thanks, go. Betty, and thanks um, for your um, uh, your notes and everything else. So I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I did want to read before the uh, before we start the official business a letter that I received from the Education Foundation. Dear members of the Wethersfield Insurance Committee, thank you for your generous contribution to the Wethersfield Education Association. In memory of Dan Silver, the foundation would not exist without Dan's work getting us off the ground, so we are especially grateful. Your donation is so important to the mission of the foundation, which is to enhance and enliven the academic programs and initiatives of the Wethersfield Public Schools. Sincerely, Jeff Cotlin, Treasurer, the Wethersfield Education Association, our foundation. So uh, thanks to all of our members of uh, the committee, our family of committee members, uh, for participating in this difficult time for Polly and her family. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Polly. Um, so we can officially start the meeting by asking uh, if there's anybody from the public on this call. No sound means no comment. Uh, we'll proceed with the approval of the meetings from the meeting of June 18, 2020. Has everyone had a chance to look at those minutes? Yep. Okay, and if have all have reviewed it, is there a motion for approval? I will make that motion. Okay, and second. is there a second? Second. Okay, and there was a second? Yes, uh, I second. Okay, all right. Me. Okay, thank you. All. Uh, all in favor of approving the minutes from June 18th, say aye. 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 Done. Okay, oh, uh, Ashley, welcome to the meeting, by the way. Always nice to have you. Okay. Yeah, we lost uh, her. He's disappeared and is on mute. He disappeared. So. I don't know where she is. <laughs> she here. I'm right. just here two minutes ago. She's scrambling to unmute her. her <laughs> okay. okay. I am All right. Here. So moving on. Next to Okay. Uh, over. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll start with uh, Chris Monroe uh, for the medical portion of the um, uh, reports. Chris, you have the floor. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, let me st first start by sharing my screen. Maybe. Make sure I got the right one. And so let me know if this is... Hey, Tom. Oh, share. Tom's coming. Tom's with us too, Frank. Okay, good. Excellent. Welcome, Tom. Let me know, folks, if my... Frank, I am here. I don't know if you can hear me now. Yeah. And who would that be? This is Ashley. Oh, yes, Ashley, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay, great. Sorry about that. No problem. Okay, so, folks, do you see... Oh, so, uh, hey, Paul, I mean, Chris, before you start, yep. I have to say that I am very, very much impressed by this whole thing right here. <laughs> yeah, just, just take it for that. I mean, you set up a screen, you did a little sharing, you didn't screw it up. It's fantastic. Well, listen, this was uh, the blind squirrel gets the nut every now and then, so <laughs> don't give me too much credit. Yeah, I'm okay. Chris, I'm trying to figure out how you did that because I don't think you, you're not supposed to have permission to do that. Oh. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> I'm better to ask a lawyer. lawyer. It's too late. <laughs> it's too late. Better to ask for <laughs> forgiveness than permission. All right, here we go. There's Tom. Hey, Tom. Yeah. Look at he's got a palm trees in the background. That's not fair. I know. Well, you know, you got to start somewhere. I'm trying to get, I was going to try to get rid of them because I didn't want to have to, but I guess I'll just keep them. Well, Looks now good. you're not going to get away without self quarantining, Tom. I know. That's right. I know. I can't tell you I'm in, I'm in Wethersfield then, huh? You're not going <laughs> to believe me. <laughs> Folks. 
I have a couple of things to dive into tonight. Um, the first two items pertain to um, our claim liability reports. I wanted to verbally provide a little bit of a recap relative to the year that ended on June 30th. And then what I wanted to do is share some information right in regards to the start of the new plan year. Um, a few comments relative to the prior year. Um, in a nutshell, we had a great year. Um, when you look at what we budgeted versus what actually came to fruition, um, we ended up driving a pretty substantive surplus for the year as a whole. Um, I think the key driver in all that was COVID. And in our prior meetings, we've talked at length about claim depression as a result of the pandemic. And that carried itself through from roughly um, April uh, through June from a claim standpoint. We simply saw a drastic reduction in claims that left us in a surplus position for the year. So um, good news in aggregate, um, when you drill down on some of the drivers, you know, we still have our historic concern over large claims. Um, we had 40 members that generated claims over 50,000. Um, those 40 members and those aggregate claims probably pushed about four and a half million dollars. So when you think about the sheer fact that we have um, around 1,200 people on the plan, uh, those 1,200 generally drive about 10, 11 million dollars a year in claims, but 50 of them are responsible for four and a half million. It certainly speaks to the magnitude of large claims within our risk pool. But the good news is we still ended up with a pretty sizable surplus for the year. Um, I think we're well positioned for the start of the new year. Um, our healthcare budget increased by roughly 12%. So even with COVID claims being down, we certainly gave ourselves uh, enough room, if you will, when those claims ultimately come back um, that I think our current cost uh, budget is uh, enough to meet that challenge moving forward. So um, last year was a great year. And when you look at the report that I put on the screen now, um, we are off to a good start uh, through the first two months of the year. Um, a couple of comments relative to the, to the report. Um, you know, our enrollment stayed consistent over the first two months. It's down a little bit from our pre-renewal estimates. Not a ton, but down a little bit. Um, when you look at where we are relative to our expenditures on the fixed cost side, actual claims, and how that rolls up relative to budget, you'll find that we're off to a good start with a sizable surplus. Um, the one thing that I want to bring your attention to is this $470,000 claim adjustment. And this is a little bit along the lines of following, follow the bouncing ball. Um, if you look at our July claims of 990, um, that is not a good way to start the year. Um, within that is, was $470,000 in claims. Um, that $470,000 claim was originally presented for payment in May of 2020. It was then reversed by Blue Cross in June of 2020, and then added back in in July of 2020. And there really wasn't anything other than Blue Cross holding the claim up for audit purposes and then ultimately releasing it. The challenge that we had is the ultimate release of that claim carried into the new plan year. And the new plan year uh, also re reflects the fact that we start brand new from a stop loss standpoint. So, you know, the argument that was raised was essentially if that claim had been processed in the, when it was originally processed, that would have fallen into the prior plan year. It would have fully gone against our prior stop loss contract. And Anthem did a nice job of saying, yep, we'll step up and we'll, uh, we'll give you that retroactive credit of the 470. So like I said, follow the bouncing ball a little bit, but the rough start in July was simply offset by that $470,000 credit 
which in turn drives the surplus that we have now. Even without that, we'd still be in a surplus position, but certainly not of the magnitude that we have um, in place so far. Right. But let me stop there. I threw a lot at you in terms of um, what happened. I just want to make sure everybody's comfortable with my explanation and, and see if you had any questions uh, based upon my comments. I think we're good. Anybody? No, I don't think so. I think we're I think it's a good explanation. I get it. Now, okay. Now, Chris, just one question. Uh, yep. This is Paul. Is the stop loss carrier honoring that uh, that no. situation? You know, the stop loss carrier in the prior year was Anthem. So um, yeah, they and you know Anthem kind of led with, hey, we need to kind of get you that money back. Um, and they were the stop loss carrier. So um, they, uh, they're gonna take uh, responsibility for it financially. Um, so it worked itself through. And, and, the, and the best exhibit, Paul, to illustrate what actually happened is this one right here, where you look at May of 20 of uh, 19, uh, or May of 20, yeah. Where we saw a million dollars in claims. Well, the 470 was in that number. Oh, and then June, we had 244. So that's where things got sideways. Gotcha. And then they threw it back in in July. But again, they uh, took care of it by essentially throwing it back into that prior year. Okay. Right. Yeah, we've so we've been reimbursed. I mean, because this crossed over the end of the fiscal year, you know, we were kind of forced to do quite a bit of work on it to make sure that, you know, we, to reconcile our accounting records to Anthem's claim records and to the, you know, to the cash disbursements. Um, so we were, you know, we've, we've looked at it 10 times over um, all the way through, you know, July when all the, all of it was resolved and we're, I'm satisfied we're, you know, everything's squared away. Yeah, and the, and, and the way I'll kind of memorialize it to make sure, you know, we're fully carrying it correctly. Um, on my exhibits moving forward, I'll still reflect it as a large claim, but the way I'll carry it is just to show it as a full 470 refund. And then I've added it here as a separate line item, claim adjustment, you know, claim adjustment. Um, so that's the way we're going to kind of carry it from a record keeping standpoint. Um, one of the things that, again, we need to be mindful of large claims, as I alluded, we've already had one person so far who's branched over the $150,000. So through two months, we've got three people in the mix, if you will. Um, one person who's already over the 150 where we're tracking that $10,000 reimbursement. And then we've got another person at uh, 57 grand. So again, um, that seems to be the bane of our existence, large claims, and we're jumping right in with one person who's already breached our pooling point um, through the month of August. Okay, any other questions? Or um, yeah, Chris, we, we have a... Um, Considering the number of large claims that we have, are they um, are they related to our demographics, or um, is there are they just that uh, diverse that um, you know there it's each is an individual um, situation? And then number two, would any of these have been could any of these been been mitigated if we'd had the uh, uh, you know, the wellness yep. program. Um, couple things, Polly. When you look at this chart, yeah, and we have so many large claims that I have to carry this chart over two exhibits. But the interesting thing when you look at this, you know, back in 14, 15, 16, um, we actually weren't too bad. You know, we'd be at the 15, 20 people range uh, when it came to people over 50 grand. So, you know, not great, mm -hmm. but not terrible. And then things really started to move against us in the last three years, where we essentially doubled our large claim output 
And when you look at it in aggregate, um, you know, 15, 17, 17, boom. And then we took right off. And we jumped right up to 28, 35, 40. And look at the aggregate spend. So it's almost like we flipped the switch and man, we took off in the wrong direction, right? Now the question becomes, what's driving that? Um, you know, right off the bat, we have a risk pool that doesn't turn over. So, you know, um, everybody stays in the risk pool. You don't see a lot of people coming and going when it comes to uh, most municipalities, Weathersfield included. So it's a stable uh, risk pool. And unfortunately for us, you've got a lot of bad risks in that risk pool. Uh, a great many of these large claims are kind of what I would call frequent flyers, where they're there each and every year. So that's a problem right off the bat. You know, what's driving that is, you know, the age of our people. You know, the average employee on the town side especially um, is, is, is older than Blue Cross's book of business. So you've got people who stick around, people who are older. Um, older people, as they age, become more susceptible to ail ailments that drive this type of activity. Um, what I would say is our workforce by and large is not what I would call maybe the healthiest. When you look at the claims within our risk pool, um, we've got a lot of orthopedics, poly, that seems to drive, maybe there's some weight issues uh, in the mix. Um, we've got a lot of cancer claims in the mix and that could get back to your question on um, would a wellness plan have helped? Well, it certainly wouldn't have hurt at us, hurt us. Um, you know, it's tough to speculate on how many of these claims, we wouldn't have eliminated them, but how much in terms of dollar value could we have driven them down <clears throat> if we had maybe regular access to wellness care? You know, when you look at our population, you know, at best 50% of people are getting their wellness services. So, you know, that clearly hasn't helped us um, but I think when you look at it in total, um, the age of the population, the ever-present risk pool, a demographic that's not known to really take care of itself, you've got a population that has really no wellness requirements in many instances, that seems to be triggering a lot of the activity that you see here. Um, what I'll do for the next meeting is I'll provide, and I won't go back to 14, but I'll go back over the last I'll probably look at these last three full plan years and I'll do more of a drill down on the type of claims, what's driving them, how many people are repeat flyers and you can, we can see ourselves the diagnosis and uh, you know, what's really um, hurting us when it comes to the large claims. And there's, there's probably no way that you can <clears throat> determine with those claims, whether, um, you said about, um, did you say that about 50% of um, that workforce are taking advantage of the wellness? Um, yeah. Or, or was that, did I hear it wrong? Yeah, no, when, when you look at <clears throat> the population and you ask yourself, of all adults who are eligible for a, a, a routine physical, how many, what's the percentage that are getting, getting those physicals? And it's generally, it's around 50%. Okay. So when you look at it from that context, 50% of the people are doing what we want them to do. 50% aren't. And again, this is speculative. You know, if the 50% did it, would we be able to get to that cancer early? Would yeah. that doctor be able to kind of, you know, grab that person by the neck and say, Hey, you're going down the wrong path health wise. You really need to clean up your act and kind of, you know, get, get a better level of health moving forward. You know, that, that's a speculative statement, but, you know, typically people find motivation through a physician and to get motivation, I guess you gotta be in front of the physician. If the mm -hmm. wellness plan that we had was kind of up and running, these people would be required to, or they'd be expected to pay a 5% surcharge uh, on, their, on their premium. Okay, thanks. Yeah. But again, look at the sheer dollar value of yeah. what we're spending um, in these last three years compared to the prior three. You know, night and day, night and day. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but again, um, it's early in the year. Uh, it's only through August. We're off to a good start. You know, obviously a concern whenever you see some of these large claims uh, tick up, but it is early. Um, again, when we set our budget and we passed along that 12% increase uh, in that cost basis, um, that should be enough to hold. You're going to see some of these COVID claims that were put off slowly coming back online. But uh, when you look at kind of where we are through the first two months, we're in pretty good shape. Thanks. But nothing else to really add on this report. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, the other two things I wanted to talk about um, really come back to the RFP that we were working on uh, in the winter, into the springtime, into the summertime. Um, I think the last time we talked, we had uh, brought everybody into the loop on the fact that we were going to move in the direction of taking our pharmacy and carving it out to express scripts. And we had kind of done the analysis. We had gotten pretty much all of the buy-in from the various unions. Um, and as we were going through that process, Anthem said, well, we're not gonna allow you to do that. Um, they originally said, you know, we don't allow groups to carve out uh, when they have less than a thousand members. And the original approach was the police were going to be left behind and there was no commitment from the teachers. So Blue Cross said, we're not going to let you carve out because when you take those two bargaining units out of the mix, you have less than a thousand members. We're not going to let you carve out. Um, we ultimately got the teachers back in and that put us over the thousand members. And Blue Cross said, well, you know, we're still not going to let you carve out. And, you know, we feel that it's um, not in your best interest to do that. Um, you know, there's such a financial benefit reaped from keeping the pharmacy under the umbrella. Um, it became a dollars and cents thing for them. It was a profitability issue, um, but they wouldn't let us do it. And, you know, our argument was the proverbial, you're telling us now, you know, we started this program process in November. We shared with them all information relative to kind of what was coming in. As the incumbent, we gave them the last opportunity to close the gap financially. We couldn't have given them more opportunities to step up. And then when they realized they were losing the business, they said, oh, by the way, we're not going to let you do it. So certainly um, a roadblock that we couldn't overcome for July. Um, so the decision has been made. We're just going to keep the RFP process moving forward. Um, so we're still going to keep, and I've uh, since engaged Cigna, Aetna, Connecticut, and essentially said the RFP that we started in G uh, January, February-ish, um, that hasn't ended. And although we're beyond July 1, we still want everybody to put forth proposals for July of 2021. So we're kind of moving in the direction of um, ending the entire relationship with Blue Cross. Now the financial terms have to make sense. Um, everything that we thought would emerge on the RX side needs to be there for next July, but um, we are moving in the direction of pulling everybody back into the mix with the strong possibility of an ending of the Blue Cross relationship for July of 2021. Again, the numbers have to make sense. Um, you know, everything has to kind of check and balance itself. Um, we will start bringing the unions into the mix on, here's the disruption results, here's the commitment from all the various players that the benefits will be replicated. Um, but you know, there's a focus on getting this out of Blue Cross's hands come July of 2021. Chris, this is Frank. Two questions? Yep. yep. First, first, did uh, Anthem take the very same position with other municipalities? Um, you know, they say that it's a cross-the-board decision, but the minute they say that, I have a colleague of mine who manages Cheshire, or he manages another Blue Cross account and they carve out. Now, when I qu questioned Blue Cross on that, their response was, well, that carve out was already in place before we started doing business with them. So it became an arrangement that we assumed, but we'd never let them do it again. 
So, you know, the, the problem, Frank, is you just don't really know what to believe coming from Blue Cross. Um, but their official party line was we don't let anybody do it. Okay. Uh, what, what's in place to advise the teachers union and the other um, uh, employee groups that were, we can't pursue that because Anthem wouldn't let us? Is there going to be a formal notice on that? Can yeah. Go through the leadership? It's, it's been filtered back. Like I know Trent Donahue is sending out a notice to all the teachers saying, hey, and he didn't pull any punches. He said we were ready to go, but Blue Cross created some obstacles that we couldn't overcome. Um, we're gonna continue to evaluate things, more to follow in the future. So that's um, essentially kind of what was done. And I think, you know, kind of word of mouth, just letting everybody know, you know, we ran into a roadblock and this thing is backburnered until uh, next year. I was just hoping there wasn't any negative blowback and they don't shoot the messenger. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think I can't speak for the various unions. Um, you know, the teachers definitely, there was a lot of heavy lifting to get them to come aboard. Um, I think the same thing applies on the town side. We did a lot of town hall meetings. Um, I think we had kind of painted a pretty good picture, Frank, that, you know, at the end of the day, you know, this is not disruptive to you. Um, the benefits do kind of lead to the ability to better control costs moving forward. So I think everybody bought in. Um, okay. So yeah, I don't think there's, I, you know, again, I don't think it's going to create a lot of agita if we resurrect this thing in another two months to say, all right, now we got to start getting serious about next July. Um, we should be okay. fine from that standpoint. Okay. All right. Anything else, Chris? Anybody, any questions for Chris? I'm not hearing anything. All set? Okay. All set. Okay. Uh, Chris Wardrip, you're up. Thanks, Chris. Right. Everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Technology is good when it's working. Um, and my colleague is done at 5.59 p.m. Not bad, too. Huh? <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think this is the first time I did it in less than a half hour. First time in 18 years. Can we put him on mute now? <laughs> <laughs> You raise your own bar, Chris. You know, Chris, you open up Pandora's box, but I'm going to shut my mouth and mute. Well done. Well done. So thank you, everyone. Um, it's great to see everybody. Obviously, um, you know, our, our thoughts and prayers go out to you, Polly, thank and your you. family. Thanks. Uh, throughout. Um, so also want to uh, recognize Ashley. How are you? Haven't seen her in a while either, so it's good to see her. And doing well, thank you. And Polly, you know, my deepest condolences as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I thought what we would do um, as we kind of come off the summer break, even though I don't even know that there is such a thing as month to month anymore. Um, but when you go a couple months, we thought it might be good to, uh, especially in this virtual format that we have, uh, to not go into specific numbers or specific detail on specific claims, but I had three agenda items. One was just an overview of like the losses, you know, from a, from a 30,000 foot view, how does this past year look? How do some of the other older years look, you know, in terms of have they developed upward or downward? And then uh, just a couple of comments about just the period we're in this pandemic period, which is pretty weird too. Second item is just a claim administration update that won't take too much time. And then the last one, which we'll spend a few minutes on and certainly do some Q&A is uh, just the what's happening broadly in the industry with property casualty insurance market trends. Um, every one of you could probably even do it right now. You could go on your, your, your browser and type in market outlook and you'll see some things that I'll, I'll mention. And, uh, and of course, throughout this, um, I know that Ashley and I, we work closely together and there may very well be some, some things that, that uh, we complement each other on. So um, first off, Ashley, I don't know if your video feed froze a little bit, but I know we can hear you. Um, yes, I'm actually dialed in. So if the video doesn't work, you're not gonna lose me. Excellent, just, um, just testing that one out, thanks. So. Um, just on like a loss summary review, um, I guess I'll start. Ashley, 
Is there anything you would want to open up with in terms of, you know, like I would say what you, what you are seeing overall, just to kind of give you the, you know, the, the floor to start because you're the one who really, you see everything when it comes to the claims on, on the town and the board. Thank you. Um, the, since the last time I ran the numbers, which was at the end of March, so if for our April meeting, um, the workers' comp has increased about $67,000, um, and the LAP has increased about $305,000. Both of those figures include claims on the current policy, the one that was effective as of 7-1-2020. Um, we have two full years that we can look at now. 2019-20 is in. Obviously, there are still open claims. Um, but compared to 2018, it's definitely trending favorably. And the current policy term is, is really on track with where we were at this point in time on the 2019 policy. Um, you know, the lap also is trending favorably. It's not quite as good the current year as we were with the 2019 at this point in time. Um, but it's definitely, you know, moving in the right direction and back on track compared to 2018. So, so overall, you know, things, things are looking favorably and hopefully, you know, we'll continue to keep the losses down. You know, we'll see what happens as things develop. Obviously, you know, with COVID, which Chris will get into in greater detail. Um, you know, we don't know what things are going to look like, but as of right now, as, as far as PERMA is concerned, there really hasn't been any major disruption that we've seen. Yep. Thank you, Ashley. Before I, uh, before I jump in, I don't know if there any questions for um, what Ashley has shared so far. Okay, um, so uh, in, in when we when we take a look, um, I know that when we were getting together physically, there were some some summary reports where you could take a look at some of the average incurred dollars on the workers' compensation program, as well as that LAP package policy um, that's a proprietary program through Kerma. And when you look at the averages, the 19 to 20 year, which obviously is still fairly green it does look good compared to those averages. Um, but what's really unique, obviously, is that with the pandemic, and especially with the school districts not having really been open this past March, the frequency or the number of claims and the dollar value of claims so far, and it's not just Weathersfield, but when we look at a number of our other clients, they are all are seeing our production um, it's going to skew averages. We're going to have to be really careful there. And, and as Ashley mentioned, one of the things we have to be really careful about is not to get what I would call happy ears. And that means you could look at some, some claim dollar totals and say, holy cow, this is amazing. Um, but we don't yet know um, about legislation regarding COVID presumption. We don't know if there will be employees who come forth you know, in the coming months with a worker's comp claim based on what they consider an occupational illness or try to connect it to their employment. So there's, there's a need to be conservative, um, but at the same time, when we look overall, and again, we're not showing any specific here, it looks good overall, both on a lap and a worker's comp side. And, um, you know, the second agenda item, I'll, I'll tie to this a little bit, just to make sure that we, you know, we, we all know that this, there's, there's no autopilot going on when it comes to monitoring the claims. Any questions? Uh, this might be a little bit far out there, but I'll ask it anyways. So I understand the, the, the difficulty with employees returning to work and, and, and the COVID situation. I mean, I, I get that. Uh, is there any possibility that we have a concern about parents who may sue the school system or the, the Board of Education because they want to keep their kids out because they're afraid about COVID or if they claim that their child uh, contracted COVID because they were in school. Any, any thought given to that? 
I know it's far um, out there, but I guess nothing's far out anymore. No, you know, Frank, you, you definitely bring up a good point, and the exposure is absolutely out there. Um, as you know, Governor Lamont sort of left it up to each individual municipality as to how they want to handle the school reopenings. There already have been um, class action suits brought across the country that, you know, we do anticipate to spill over into Connecticut regarding proper education and, and you know, affording the, the appropriate time and dedication to each student. <laughs> Okay. I don't know if that helps a little bit. But. Well, I, 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 I think there's no good answer. There's no right or wrong answer. I just sense that the propensity for it is there, but I, I, I understand and I agree, actually, that there's just no way to control that. I mean, it's people will do what people will do. Mm-hmm. It's just that it's kind of a – it's out there, but it, it can't be measured because we don't have any experience on it. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. There's, there's no, um, you well, know, legal way. precedent that it's, it's difficult. Okay. Let me ask a different angle on that, and not to belabor it. But if uh, if that situation occurred, would uh, redress be to just pay the, uh, well, of course, this is a liability issue, not a claim issue, because the, the claim would be paid as the child is a, is a dependent, so the medical side would be paid. But I, I'm wondering if uh, if there's a suit, how aggressively we would pursue that, but it probably depends on the nature of the suit. So all unknowns, right? Did I answer yes. that question? Uh, exactly. Unfortunately, yes, the answer is there is no clear answer. Okay. In Frank, uh, hope for the best. Chris, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and obviously we're watching everything very closely. Um, you know, from workers' comp, COVID being presumptive, to the new police accountability legislation that's just passed. So, you know, again, there's there's really no legal precedent set. So it's it's going to just sort of have to play itself out until you know there's some case law or or some changes. Yeah. Well, you kind of opened Pandora's box with the uh, the police accountability. You want to talk about that at all as it affects the town? Um, um, you know, I can if you give me two seconds because I don't want to misspeak. Um, basically, there there's a lot of different parts to the bill, so it's it's pretty complicated. One portion that everyone is focusing on is the police accountability. Um, Wait, hold on one second. I just want to pull one thing up for you. Okay. We have um, CCM, which is the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities in tandem with Kerma, put out a really good summary document. Um, and it sort of goes through all of the different sections and, and outlines everything. So the, the big sections are sections one through four and 15 which modifies the post council membership. So that's the, the accreditation, um, requires police officers to pass a drug test, um, includes testing for anabolic steroids, permits post to suspend and offer certification up to 45 days, things like that. Um, sections 10 and 11 require each law enforcement agency that serves in a quote unquote relatively high concentration of minority residents to develop a report regarding efforts to recruit, retain, and promote minority police officers. Um, you know, and, and it sort of, it goes on and continues, but, but this, I mean, is, is opening, like you said, Pandora's box. A lot of the concerns that, that we're anticipating is, um, you know, maybe early retirement or not as many officers you know, voluntarily wanting to join the police academy at this point because there there is a chance. You know, obviously the the allegation it needs to be proven that the action that was taken was you know wanton and you know malicious. But you know, the Kerma policy will defend claims brought until such allegations are either founded or unfounded. Um, you know, again, there's 
there's sort of a lot of moving pieces to this one. And, you know, like, like I said, until uh, case law comes down, it's, it's sort of the wild, wild west right now. No pun intended. Well, you know, actually, that's yeah. a really, really excellent. I, 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 kudos to Kerma for thinking that deep on this whole, you know, unknown. Um, Thank you. I'm gonna, uh, you know, really, I, I'm pleased with that. One, one other little tangential question, and Mike, this is one for you. Um, do all of our police officers wear body cameras? I don't believe all of them do. I'm not. I'm not sure, Frank. Uh, those cameras were purchased two years ago. They were, they began implementing them less than a year ago. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think all officers do. I, and I, I, I don't, I, I think they're, they're fairly prevalent. Yeah. But I don't know the answer. Hey, Frank, this is, this is Chris. Um, yeah. you know, specific questions on this, this subject. You know, maybe what we can do is we can put them together and if there's a need for some sort of um, subcommittee or not a subcommittee, but another type of section um, might be good to know. But one thing I do want to mention is uh, some of the, the, the biggest focus had to do with that doctrine of qualified immunity. Yeah. And obviously it's creating, you know, a, a pretty strong response from a number of different parties. The uh, the legislation under that, I think it's um, section 41 of the 71 page document, uh, that technically goes into effect July 1st, 2021. So, so there have been some questions from some of our clients about, you know, how is our current insurance program structured? You know, what do we need to be thinking about? And um, right now there's, you know, the, the coverage that's in play is appropriate coverage but over the coming months, you know, there will, it'll be interesting to see the, the developments. And secondly, there are some very experienced attorneys that, um, that agree that, you know, it's going to take probably one, two, three years to see case law shaped to really. Right. Well, the, the, the real interesting part about this bill is it basically goes against the, the federal standard for police training. So really, you know, this qualified immunity is granted under federal law. Um, and, and now in the state of Connecticut, they're, they're pulling that back a little bit or restricting it. But the problem is, is that if cases are brought, they're most likely not going to make it to the federal Supreme Court, they'll only go to the state Supreme Court. So there's, already sort of conflicting case law out there based on the, the federal guidance and, you know, things that have come down compared to what is expected to incept, like Chris said, uh, next said this coming 7-1. Okay. So can I just ask, um, so the, one of the things that um, I was not clear on was um, when they were, when there was the, um, issue of the um, personal liability of, um, uh, you know, of a police officer be basically saying that, a, and I could be wrong on my interpretation, but that a um, police officer who um, could, would be uh, open to um, personal, you know, personal liability to a personal suit. Um, and of course, one of the answers is, well, you know, if you're, if you're, if you were doing a good job and you weren't, you know, you didn't do anything wrong, then you're not going to get sued, which is completely untrue. But, um, right. but the other question was then, of course, who was going to pay for the personal liability uh, for an individual, um, for an individual policeman? Um, so the, again, the question or the the kind of pat answer that I was hearing was, well, that cost would be picked up by the municipality. So, you know, my question right now is, um, so if, a, if at this particular time tomorrow, we have an officer who is, um, and granted it's not in force yet, but um, so we have a, the, you know, municipality is sued and then the decision is made by the, um, you know, by the claimant, which wouldn't, why wouldn't they to then 
um, bring suit against the individual officer. Is the, the, does the policy cover that at this particular point um, for, that in, you know, for that individual's liability? Or would it not, so particular it, point, it would it not be permitted? Right, Polly. So, so, and again, I mean, it's so hard to say because it no, no, I understand that. Yeah, circumstances, but but the intent of the policy is is not to cover malicious or intentional wrongdoing. Right, right. And and that's what the whole issue is, is because it's really an uninsurable risk because yeah. the the officers are losing governmental immunity potentially even though they've objectively been you know operating in good faith and you know from what i understand from the legislation it has to go before a review board and and also to court there's no sort of first appeal process so i think the officer actually would have to go to court again i'm not positive and i'm happy um you know we can talk about this mike and Chris offline, if, if you want me to have one of my claims folks or attorneys come and speak to this point, they've done a lot, a lot of, you know, research and presentations and analysis of the situation. And they definitely can speak to it much better than I can. Uh, well, my, my whole question basically boils down to when, um, when, when people, when the uh, individual police officers or people who, you know, are told that um, any type of personal, you know, if there had to be personal um, coverage or um, for, you know, I as a as a police officer now would have to um, get that coverage, whether it was through my homeowners or my umbrella or what special endorsement or whatever. And, and I can see there being a cost to it, but when the answer is, well, the municipality would, would um, be responsible for, for picking that up, one of the big things that we have had a problem with municipality board of ed is unfunded mandates. And, um, you know, this all sounds like a really great idea, but, um, what ultimately would the cost be to the town? And I mean, I don't need to have a, an in-depth conversation at this particular point, you know, with somebody, but that's the question that I'm raising in, and maybe it can't be determined at this and, point. And you know, Polly, that's, that's a great question. About. Yeah, and, and when this was up on the Hill before it, it went to session and passed, we had, um, a lot of our municipalities trying to quantify the projected dollar amount that could be associated with this, you know, to right. try to push back and advocate having the bill passed. And, and again, I mean, it's, it's easy to, to get a base estimate of, you know, the exposures, but again, the dollars associated with it, it's uh, again, I, I hate to say it, but unfortunately, again, there's really, no solid answer right now. We're not going right. to right. have a figure associated with it until we start seeing things come in. You know, hopefully okay. they won't. Connecticut obviously has been, you know, a really great state in that regard. I think a lot of this, you know, and this is my personal opinion, is a knee-jerk reaction to issues that are going on elsewhere in the country. Um, I, I don't think the bill had enough time to really, you know, sort of be talked about and, and thought about. Yeah. But my sense here is that um, I, 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 I welcome some, uh, you know, feedback from the committee, but I think that there are too many what ifs to have a substantial conversation on this. And I think that we should rely on um, uh, Chris and Ashley to bring us up to date on a monthly basis in terms of something is really brewing that we should address as opposed to just continuing to, uh, you know, postulate on what might or might not happen. Uh, it's just, it's too wild right now. Would everyone agree um, that we should rely on Chris and Ashley just to keep us informed on a monthly basis? If, it, as it, it no, if no more than, no, there's no, no changes or something is brewing, how do you people feel about that? That's fine. I agree. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Okay, okay. And, 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 and not to belabor it, but one final thought is that uh, the reason I asked you, Mike, about body cams is 
uh, would an, an organization like Kerma give consideration to uh, pricing whatever it is has to be priced uh, if an entire police force had body cams and wore them, uh, it seems to me that mitigates some of the risk. That, that's all I want to bring up, but I don't want to have a discussion on it. But that's kind of like why I asked the question. So and it'll be more questions like that, but let's just table with that for the discussion uh, pending uh, what we hear from Ashley and Chris. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay, we opened a Pandora's box on that one, Ashley, but really... Sorry uh, about that. <laughs> oh, no, I... I, I well, they're always I, the most interesting conversations, though. No, 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 I, I think it's actually critical. I think that we have a, a greater propensity to see claims along that line than we do with COVID, to be perfectly honest with you. I, I and, agree. Yeah, because the uh, the ignition point on that is much higher, so... Mm-hmm. Okay. Chris, sorry to take away from you, but why don't you go ahead and continue? I think Ali actually brought up a really great issue there. No, no problem at all. It's all risk management. So um, 2B, uh, the, the claim administration activity update, this is just reiterating that um, at least one or two times per year, there's a formal review of the larger open liability claims as well as the workers' compensation claims. And the purpose which we've talked about in the past is one, um, you know, Kerma does a great job be, being available with their claims adjusters and managers to talk with, you know, human resource people at the town. Um, Mike O'Neill's there, uh, town manager's there, and also on the school business manager side. The idea is to understand on both sides, from Weathersfield side as well as Kerma side, what's the latest status on open claims, whether it be third-party litigation, whether it be a worker's comp claim. Secondly, it's just reviewing and refining the strategy. You know, what if it's a large worker's comp claim, is there a return to work program? Is there a, is there a pathway for the employee to get back? Is the employee represented by legal counsel? Have they had multiple other claims? You know, are they looking to have some sort of a settlement to move on? You know, so the strategy becomes important. Um, there's a review just to take a look at the, the dollar reserves. Are they appropriately set? And then on these larger open claims, you know, with the, the meeting of the minds, that's the best way to move these claims forward to closure to make sure that employees who have large workers comp claims that, you know, they're getting appropriate treatment, they're getting back to the workplace, um, that yeah, um, we're just removing communication gaps and things like that. And, and uh, so the workers' comp claim review was actually August 11th, went very well. And uh, next week we have a liability, you know, auto property claim review set. So just wanted to mention that uh, these are, they're, they are important. Um, they're a whole lot more robust than just getting a loss report and seeing claims on a paper. Um, so uh, any questions about the process? No, I think that's being very proactive. Any right. other questions from the, from the committee? Yeah, all good. Okay. All right, and then the, uh, the last item, 2C, just an, an update on property casualty, you know, market and risk trends. If you go back to this past spring, when we had our different uh, discussions uh, as a committee, we were talking about market conditions and they, they were not good. We were, you know, so we're, we're kind of in that first, uh, couple months of the pandemic and kind of wondering how is that wrapping into this. But for at least a couple of years now, the property casualty marketplace has been showing an uptick in just different rates. Um, in 2017 and 2018, there were more billion dollar plus property losses, whether they be windstorm, you know, hurricane variety, there are hail storms that were taking place and and really it was catching the eye of a lot of these global reinsurers. As we have made our way through 2019 and through 2020 here, the marketplace has actually gotten worse over the past few months based on all the different um, detail that we have. And when I say worse, I'm, 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 it's both a reinsurance view it's a national property casualty industry view, all, you know, all industry, you know, not just municipalities. 
But as we look to um, how Weathersfield did in July of 2020, the endorsement and the agreement to enter into that budget stabilization agreement on that lap policy with Kerma was a very, very good move because it creates some stability with a, a rate cap, assuming that obviously you, you continue to work well um, to meet the risk management you know, recommendations and controlling losses, which you're doing. Um, and that was a, that's a smart move. But as we look at the next you know, six to 12 months, all insurance carriers, um, insurance organizations, and the buyers of the insurance they're feeling these headwinds. And so as we make our way quarter to quarter towards next summer, and certainly we all hope we have some sort of a vaccine by that time, um, but you know, to allow us to get together in person. But as we look at that, we're gonna wanna pay attention to some of these macro you know, market changes that are impacting the property side. The liability side, you know, think about traumatic brain injuries, abuse molestation exposures. Um, COVID is its own, you know, giant question mark hitting different lines of coverage. Um, the cyber marketplace, it continues to evolve and, and in some ways erode too. So that's another area. So um, we have some market update documents that I could certainly distribute to you, but I just wanted to mention, uh, you know, do your own, you know, go, go on the internet and type in property casualty market update. You'll see a lot of what we're talking about. But again, I think, um, you know, and, and, and I know Ashley would say this too, and certainly if she wishes to elaborate, that'd be great. But I know that Kerma not only manages, you know, to make sure that they are um, helping protect their members, but they're also having independent reviews to make sure their financial position is one that is sound. And they're trying to, you know, make sure that they're not going up too much or down too much uh, with the rates to create consistency. So, you know, we're in a, we're in a very, you know, I would say the market today is more difficult uh, generally than it has been in over 20 years. And, uh, I just wanted to make sure that it was an agenda item because, you know, in some ways, the insurance industry is a giant pool, and uh, we want to we want to stay on top of these things. So there will be more more to share in the coming months uh, on this subject. But uh, yeah, go ahead. To, to, yeah, to echo what Chris said, I was participating um, in an economic overview for for insurance industry leaders, and it it was a really interesting webinar. They started out with the financial market and the economy and the changes that that's having and all the blue chip numbers and then sort of how that's trickling down into the insurance industry. I think I actually have a copy of the recording. Um, it was really, really interesting um, and, and explained very clearly and very well. Um, but, you know, like Chris said, the, the market, not necessarily from a public entity standpoint, but from more of a global commercial standpoint, are definitely hardening. Um, Karma maintains its mission to provide stable rates over the years. So, you know, as far as our financials go, we're, we're still very strong with our surplus. Um, you know, obviously, we, we were still able to distribute member equity this past year, despite COVID and the concerns. That's how strong our finances were. Um, you know, but we, we, to a certain degree, are subject to those commercial market changes for, you know, our reinsurance partners. But, you know, Kerma is the whole purpose of Kerma. We were created at times like this when the market hardens when there is an availability for coverage, you know, hopefully it won't get to that point again. But again, you know, that's, that's why the pool was started and that's what we're here for. So our intent is to maintain the line and continue doing what we've been doing for the past, you know, almost 40 years. Yeah, and, um, in, in, any questions, uh, Frank? No, I, 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 those are all things that we as the insurance committee should be aware of because to the degree that we can be proactive by spotting 
trends and reacting to them is far better than getting surprises. So I, I, I applaud, you know, uh, uh, USI's efforts and Kermit's efforts uh, to keep us informed because of the work that you folks are doing. You know, it's just no surprises here. I mean, well, sure, I want all the surprise, but, you know, you're keeping us informed so that we can react properly. So thank you. Committee oh, members, any thoughts? Committee members? Hello. <laughs> No, we're all okay. Set. No, we got okay. it. Okay. Right. Anything else? If not, we're, I think, uh, Chris, all set? Ashley, yes. all set? Yep, okay. all set. Thank you. Okay. Finally, uh, no, not finally. Sorry. <laughs> Didn't want to, uh, you to rush out of the gate here, Greg. Uh, any other business to discuss? I'm listening. No. Okay. The next meeting is October 15th. Uh, I have no doubt whatsoever that we will do another Zoom meeting. Uh, and um, may I have a motion, entertain a motion to um, adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second? Second. Second. The meeting is officially adjourned. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Have a good night. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Okay.